So hello to everyone. We are back again for an easy jam chat. I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Giuseppe Ristagno from Milan. Giuseppe. Hello. Hello, Fabio. Hello, everyone. Uh, Giuseppe, the topic today will be a thing, a topic that you like. Uh, we will talk about uh, defibrillation uh, during cardiac arrest. So the first question would be, is it a shockable rhythm uh, frequent after cardiac arrest? Okay, yes, uh, uh, shockable rhythm actually um, is decreased over the times. And today, approximately one third of cardiac arrest uh, presents uh, shockable rhythm. But it is also true that it depends by the EMS arrival time, because the studies have reported that if you arrive on the scene within the first three minutes, the percentage of shockable rhythms can increase up to 65-70%. So this is probably why, for example, in some studies where the number of bystander CPR is very high, you have higher chances to have a shockable rhythm, I presume. Yes, exactly. This is what we have seen in the most recent uh, large randomized trials with incredible percentage of shockable rhythms. And uh, if you look to uh, the witness uh, bystander performance CPR, also the percentage are quite high. Quite yeah. high. And of course, if I ask you which is the percentage in patients with in-hospital cardiac arrest, is it different? Yeah, the, the, it is different because usually for in-hospital cardiac arrest, we have other um, comorbidities, uh, other uh, pathological conditions that leads the patients into cardiac arrest. So there we have mainly uh, no shockable rhythm. Okay, so about the fibrillation. So what I have uh, learned is that the fibrillation can save lives. This is why we have the fibrillation also, I mean, many places outside the hospitals. Yeah. Uh, the first question for you is, uh, can you remind us what the guidelines tell us about uh, defibrillation? When to defibrillate, how much time, um, how many times, which is the energy? <laughs> yes. Well, guidelines say to defibrillate as soon as possible in, in the instance of a shockable cardiac arrest. So um, rescuer will start with a chest compression while they deploy the defibrillator. But once the defibrillator is ready, then the fibrillation should be uh, delivered immediately. Uh, after that, uh, we will proceed uh, with um, two minutes cycles. So every two minutes, we stop uh, CPR, we analyze the rhythm, and uh, in case of, of a shock of rhythm, we uh, deliver another defibrillation. Uh, regarding the energy, uh, usually we should set uh, at least 150 joules, uh, and then uh, if the defibrillators allow us to increase, we can increase the subsequent energy uh, in subsequent shocks uh, just to um, provide more chance. So it's an important message because I see sometimes people want to defibrillate many times. The idea is to do one shock, except the situation, for example, in the cat lab. Yes, sure. the well, well, right. So well, most of the time you respect the cycle and defibrillation, right? Right, o only a single shock, except if you have a witness cardiac arrest in an already monitored patient. So there uh, you can deliver three shocks uh, concurrently. Just be because if you, you see uh, a patient going in VF inside of your eyes, then um, VF just started and the myocardia is vital. So make no sense to perform CPR, you just defibrillate. Last question, because it's important to introduce the next question, is when you consider a, a shock rhythm to be refractory to defibrillation? Uh, yes, a uh, shock of rhythm is considered refractory when uh, after the defibrillation we still uh, uh, have uh, uh, either ventricular fibrillation or pastorous ventricular tachycardia. And the uh, subsequent shocks uh, are still uh, uh, unsuccessful. Um, so this is the definition. Then usually for the studies it is considered refractory if a uh, uh, shock of rhythm persists after three shocks. After three shocks. Yeah. So that's now the main question, because we have a, a quite interesting randomized clinical trial uh, published recently in New England Journal of Medicine on uh, not only defibrillate, no, not defibrillate, but how to defibrillate. Can you summarize for uh, right. our, our, the people that listen to us the, 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 the idea of the study, the methodology, and the main results? Uh, yes, this is actually an, an incredible study, because uh, um, we have seen many... Um, large trials failing in, um, in primary outcomes or, or in the aim. Uh, and they said this study with a relative few number of patients actually uh, is probably is one of the first uh, positive studies in the field of cardiac arrest. 
um, uh, Dr. Sheldon Chesk introduced a new approach to defibrillation. So in this study, uh, he compared uh, the so-called double sequential external defibrillation, which is a new uh, methodology uh, that consists in delivering two sequential shocks by two uh, defibrillators. Uh, through pets that are placed in a different way. So uh, one is the classical uh, anterolateral position and the other is the anterior posterior. Um, the other group uh, in study is uh, called vector change. So uh, after uh, three unsuccessful defibrillation, the rescuer change the, the pet's orientation from anterolateral to anterior posterior. And the third group was a control group. Um, so the population was out of hospital cardiac arrest with refractory cardiac arrest. And um, the, uh, the people who were randomized were only 405. Actually, at the beginning, the study was designed to enroll more than 900 patients, but due to COVID, uh, um, it was stopped uh, earlier. Um, there were approximately 130, 140 patients per each group. And the primary outcome was uh, uh, survival to hospital discharge. But then there were also many other important secondary outcome, termination of VF uh, and uh, neurological recovery and, and ROSC. So just before you tell us the results, so it's important to explain, we are not talking about changing something on the defibrillator. We are, we are talking about the two defibrillators on the same patient where the position of the defibrillator is changing. And these patients are randomized when there are three shocks already delivered who have not converted the shock of a rhythm to a yeah. spontaneous circulation. So that's exactly. the setting. Great. Exactly. After, after uh, yes, the, the so-called uh, uh, refractory VA. Uh, so in one group, they change the, the, the vector of the defibrillation. In another group, uh, uh, they deliver simultaneously two defibrillation with different uh, uh, vectors. So, uh, behind the, this study, there, there is an important pathophysiological um, hypothesis because basically, um, uh, if uh, uh, the, the energy, uh, the, the current delivered by the defibrillator uh, cannot reach totally the left ventricle and, and especially the, the focus of the malignant arrhythmia, then the F can restart. So the idea behind that is that uh, by delivering uh, the, um, the, the shock through different vectors, we are able to uh, cover um, the wall area of the left ventricle. Uh, so this is true for the group uh, so-called vector change. In the group of, of double sequential defibrillation, we have this concept plus uh, delivering two defibrillation at the same time, so higher energy. Um, so you told us that this is a positive study. What, what does it mean? Which are the main results? Uh, yeah, for, for, for the primary outcome, which was uh, survival to hospital discharge, uh, both group, double sequential uh, uh, external defibrillation and vector change, um, presented a significantly higher survival to hospital discharge. So it was approximately 30% in the double sequential shock and 21% in the vector change, and only 13% in the, in the control group. But also the termination of VF was uh, positive, significantly positive in both uh, the, the two uh, interventional groups compared to the standard one. Uh, and uh, in the group of double sequential shock, also uh, the percentage of ROSC and, neuro um, and the neurological recovery were both significantly uh, greater compared to the control group. So um, this is incredible with only 400 patients divided into three, randomized into three groups. So now, of course, you have been part of many uh, group that has uh, delivered the guidelines. Uh, ERC, ASIC. So my question would be, from your point of view as a researcher, how this study will immediately or almost immediately influence, if ever, the guidelines? Well, <laughs> this is a one million question because uh, uh, it is true the study was positive and probably will have an important impact on, on future guidelines. Uh, but we have to consider also some, some limitation, let's say. Uh, first of all, uh, the primary outcome was uh, survival, long-term long survival. And uh, we don't know anything about uh, post-resuscitation care uh, about these patients. So we don't know if uh, uh, there was some difference in the post-resuscitation treatments. 
Uh, then another important point, especially for the double uh, defibrillation, is uh, um, the, 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 the easy uh, to apply this uh, treatment because uh, you need uh, to carry on two defibrillators. Uh, so you need more training, you need also expertise because uh, the, the two defibrillations need to be delivered uh, almost simultaneously. Um, so it, it requires uh, some implementations. Um, on the other side, instead, if we consider only the vector change, this is something easier to be applied. Um, so probably uh, guidelines will not change immediately, but for sure, uh, this can be another option that you can consider after uh, in the instance of refractory cardiac arrest. And indeed, if you look to the past guidelines, the 2021, these, uh, the, the suggestion to change the vector or the fibrillation was already um, considered as a possible potential uh, last option treatment. So this is something that uh, probably will be not recommended routinely, but can be considered. Now, you, you have, of course, uh, read in depth uh, the paper because it's uh, one of the topics you've been also working uh, in experimental setting. And my question is, do you think that the setting where the study is done uh, represents, for example, uh, what we see currently also in many European countries? Uh, because uh, just an example, I remember a study on transfer to the hospital, many criticism were due, for example, to the presence of paramedics where the care does not entirely represent what has been done in some countries, for example, Belgium, where we have a doctor going into the, into the ambulance. So do you think that the setting could influence the baseline results that you observe in the control group? Is the proportion of patients that have uh, a response to defibrillation in the control group uh, reasonable to you? It looks like what we see, for example, in Europe, in other registry. Um, well, I have to say that, okay, the, the, the setting was different, is different compared to Europe because um, in the US there are paramedics and this study was performed mainly by paramedics. Uh, but on the other side, uh, if you look to the percentage of uh, ROSC, percentage of uh, even long-term survival, um, this time uh, these uh, percentages are quite similar to the European um, conditions. And also if you look uh, uh, we were discussing before about uh, uh, percentage of witness cardiac arrest or bystander CPR. In this study, we, we didn't see the, the incredible numbers that we saw in, in many recent trials. Mm, there was like 60% of witness cardiac arrest and 55 or 60% of, of bystander CPR. So very similar to um, the, what, what we can see in the most communities. So I, I think that these results can be uh, easily reproduced. In our situation, in our condition, other uh, conditions. So, Giuseppe, thanks a lot uh, to highlight uh, and use your experience to explain us this very, very interesting, as you said, uh, a study published in New England, discussing about defibrillation that we, as intensive, is quite often used even in hospital. And uh, thanks for everything, and hope to see you soon in the next uh, EasyChem chat. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you for this discussion. Bye and bye to everyone.